Yay! So hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Refresh. It's a time to connect, to be inspired, or learn something, and ultimately, as you know, feel a bit better for this time together. Together. I was thinking about that. Um, feels like a salve in a time of sadness, and we've had some sadness. Together is a lift. It's a kindness. Uh, together feels like an antidote, an elixir. I don't know if you can prescribe that, doctor, but together is a, a power of force that can get you up mountains and down for that matter, but ones that you didn't even think you could climb or descend. It takes a village, in other words. And I hope that doesn't sound trite because it's true and because our lives, the quality of our collective lives are intertwined, not only by our proximity, physical proximity, yes, but about the expansiveness in our thinking and our desire to learn, which is why I love our community so much, right? The idea of traveling outside of our areas of comfort to understand how the world works and how it could ultimately work better, mm -hmm. right? And if it can, how can we be a part of that working better? There's a together in that as well, right? So today we invited all of you to join us to think about your legacy. I know mm -hmm. I love Katie, Katie Graham really positioned this well. So thank you, Katie. I thought it was bold and interesting because as we think of our families, the basic human desire is what? We just want them to be happy. We want them to be healthy. That's what we want for ourselves, right? We want to have access to fundamental resources, clean air, clean water, good food, right? And quality health care, right? So when we think of our broader family, our dear friends and beyond that, our community, our neighbors and our communities, I don't know, I grew up, there's this book on my shelf, it was the family of man. And as I got older, you know, you wouldn't be surprised me to ask, why wasn't it the family of women, right? The access to fundamental resources though, are the backbone of building a more equitable world. What is our part? How do we participate? For isn't that the most important legacy we could leave, a world where more can thrive, not just survive? And when it comes to our health, I just came back from a week health retreat. Mm. I realized I don't spend nearly enough time just thinking about my own health, but I am concerned about yours. That's why we're here, right? That of our families, our communities and beyond. You see, um, what the pandemic has taught us, I think, is that our health is the most precious thing we have. Mm -hmm. And what we've learned is that it's our health, the word, our phrase, our health, is not a singular mm -hmm. reference. It's a collective reference, our health. Helen Keller said, and I love this quote, the welfare of each is bound up in the welfare of all. So today, as we continue to be concerned about our health, that of our families and communities, we have the pleasure to spend time with an extraordinary doctor woman, leader, scientist, researcher, right? Dr. Fal and you can't, Dr. Falakami Odedna. She's a Mayo Clinic prostate cancer scientist and global health equity mm -hmm. researcher. She's devoted her care to addressing health and wellness in our communities. She has led global research programs. This is amazing, primarily funded by the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, and the DOD, the Department of Defense. And these programs have focused on understanding the root causes of health disparities and implementing cost-effective community-based behavioral intervention to improve health of minority populations worldwide. You are an angel, you're a brilliant angel. We're glad that you brought all of this to us today. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for inviting me. And I've heard so much about your program and such an honor to be here, not only am I here, but to be representing your clinic today and representing our community. And I am so delighted to be in Jacksonville. I'm living in Jacksonville as well. Um, I just sort of feel honored to be part of this program. And, uh, you know, and I think your opening was such a, you know, it just so moved me because that is one of the things that we as women don't do. We take time really taking care of other people and we lose sight of who we are and we lose sight of taking care of ourselves. So thank you so much for opening with you saying that you, you had a retreat and you, you know, um, you know, really taught about self-care. So I got role modeling that. That is perfect. I don't think I'm really that good <laughs> in role modeling that. So, so thank you for reminding, reminding us about that. So I have to make a mental note that I got to do a health retreat myself. <laughs> 
absolutely. Maybe we should meet on the walk with the beach. We can get Ashley Pratt to join absolutely. us. It would be wonderful. Hey, I'm Ashley, awesome. me, you, and Donna, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so let me, let's, start, let's start off from the beginning. I, we know, well, I know that you were born in Nigeria. I'm not sure yeah. when you came here, but what, what got you interested in this path? Oh my goodness. So this is really great, uh, great opening. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that, yes, you know, proudly Nigeria, proudly black, proudly woman. Uh, that's, you know, I identify myself. I'm proud, you know, proudly a, a woman of faith, of, of course, as well. Born in Nigeria. And, you know, one of the people have asked me, why did I become so much engrossed in doing this kind of thing? And, that, uh, you know, it, it just takes me back to growing up you know, I grew up in a, you know, social economically deprived environment, lower social economic status. Uh, my mom struggled with asthma all her life. And the, the, the thing that I hear the most when I was growing up is my mom wheezing, wheezing, unable to breathe. And always it scares me because I'm always thinking, because I did lose a very close friend of mine to asthma when I was in, 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 um, in high school. So I'm always at the back of my mind when I'm waking up and I hear my mom, my mom like, is this a last breath? And, you know, everything was, was just so, they, it was like there was no way out. The, the issues of social determinants of health, the environment that we were living in contributed uh, to 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 our asthmatic symptoms, the fact that we were we were not in a high social economic status to be able to afford what we would need, and so that is one of the reasons why I decided that this is this can't be it for people. We'll just be we don't have a choice of where we are born. Let's just say that way. Nobody says, you know, I'm coming from heaven. This is where I want to go. You are where you are, and it is unfair that because of where you are you know, where you are, your environment and, and, and where you happen to be, that you should not have access to health, that you should not have, you know, everything that everybody else needs. So I kind of grew up with that in me from, from what my mom is. And so the question is, how did I, how did I land in the United States? So, um, you know, interestingly, my first degree is in pharmacy. Um, you know, I have another story to tell about how, how I got to do pharmacy, but I, I'll tell that at another time. Um, but, you know, being a pharmacist, and, and once I graduated, I, I practiced as a pharmacist in several places. I just, you know, I, I practiced in the hospital setting, I worked in a, in, a, in a pharmaceutical company, I worked in a community pharmacy. I just did not get that point that I'm doing what I could do the best to help our communities, minoritize the marginalized community. So, the best way for me to do research was to do research. And, and that's when I thought my, my brother, you know, you know, was in the United States and he said, there are outstanding programs in the United States that will allow you to really learn about how to really do research that helps the community because I know that's what you're kind of passionate about. And so, um, you know, I got accepted to University of Florida and the, the rest is history. That's kind of how I got on that path. Wow, wow. And um, what have you learned along the way? Now, have you been in Florida for a year, right? No, no I, a couple years, right? Because yeah. you were in different places before you Yeah, came. Yeah, I've been a mayor in Jacksonville for a year. I've been in Florida for over 25 years. So, and I've been in academia for over 30 years. Uh, I started my um, academic research after I graduated from University of Florida at Rural Appalachian because I wanted to go to where I felt, regardless of who I was, where I felt that I could really make a good contribution. So I actually started my health disparities research in Rural Appalachian, which allowed me to be able to um, really work in you know, very rural area, Appalachian region, and work in the areas of, 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 of disparities. From there, I, I transitioned to Florida a and University, and then I was at Moffitt Cancer Center, and then at University of Florida. So one of the things that I've learned, you know, along as just kind of being that number one, there's so many things. A lot of times, for those of us who are in the academic setting, one of the things that I realized earlier on was that you cannot sit in your ivory tower and dictating what you feel is going to help the community. The, you know, the ivory tower symptom does not work. So you really have to, you know, go to the adage, and I love the fact that you said that with if the problem, you know, you know uh, it takes a village, which is an African proverb, because when a problem is in the community, the solution is in the community. So we have to step down from an ivory tower sometimes in the academia 
and really look at the community to lead us in where we can address anything that actually impacts health disparities. So, you know, we know that biology has something to do with it. Yes, I work very closely with several of my colleagues who are looking at genomics and genetics etiology of, of disparities. But the most significant thing that impacts us is the social determinants of health where we live, where we walk, our environment, access to healthcare system, access to good food, have access to healthy food, our ability to be able to exercise, you know, our ability to be able to address things that are within our, our system. That is kind of, you know, where we have to. And one of the things, you know, I've been in academia, like I said, for over 30 years. I'm in that era that I tell people, like, I am really in my legacy era. You know, I, I think it is all about how do we decentralize what we do to address health disparities so that the solutions are created in our communities and they stay in our communities? That, that is where the problem is. That is where the solutions should be. And working very closely and in partnership with community leaders to be able to do this. Wow. Let me just say, we always say hello to our guests on Zoom and we have guests on Facebook that join us from all over. Um, so I just want to make sure we say hello to everybody. And I see that Betty, hey, Betty, Betty Embaum, Dr. Betty Embaum, she's a PhD. She actually works for a company up in New York City. She's from Cameroon. Uh, and she works on health disparities too. So I'm excited to connect the two of you to amazing thought leading women doing work that really matters. Tell me a little bit about the themes that you're seeing in terms of health disparities. I know there's lots of data out there. You often say, let's not look at the statistics. Let's talk about root causes. Yeah, yeah. So you, you are very right on that because the, you know, the, the statistic that I always say for me, I do this globally and the statistics are just, you know, loved ones and members and families who are, you know, tears and cries. So let's kind of look at what causes health disparities. There are three layers of what causes health disparities. And I'm, I'm going to go from macro to micro. The macro level is what is known as the health system factors, right? So if you look at the health system factors, it is, do we have access, right? Do, are we able to create access to the community? Are we really using culturally competent and culturally sensitive way of addressing the communities? Are the things that we are doing within the healthcare system, are they providing the right things? So for example, when you think about the healthcare system, in addition to providing care, in addition to providing access, we need to think about how we're providing that care and how we're providing the access. Are we really looking at tailoring the care and tailoring the access to the diverse populations rather than saying that all kinds of sizes fits everybody. Sometimes people tend to look at everybody that they have like the same. No, we are not the same. You need to tailor the care. You need to think about what are the risk factors for each individual and tailor the care to them. Another area that I'm passionate about, which also comes from the LK system level, is the access to um, clinical trials. And if you think about it, majority of the things that we actually are supposed to be doing uh, to get the right therapies for people starts with clinical trials. So what are we doing within the healthcare system to make sure that we really are very conscious because representation matters. We, we, we want to make sure that there is diversity and there's representation. That is the healthcare system level. Another one that a lot of times don't want to often talk about is the provider level factor. So we talk about the, the physicians, we talk about the pharmacists, we talk about the nurses, we talk about healthcare providers, you know, and sometimes we don't want to think about this, but as a woman of color, I know I have experienced this. There is discrimination within the healthcare system. Hello, let's just call it out. There is discrimination. People are marginalized, people are minoritized, people are treated the same way. I can remember, you know, you know, this is one of the things that people don't realize. Like, although I've, I've been in the healthcare system, I was a pharmacist for many years, I've been in research for over 30 years. Even when people see me, when the providers see me, they see me as a black woman, right? So I still experience that discrimination within the healthcare system. But I always tell people I am a letter writer. I'm not going to fight with you, but I'll write to the bottom. You know, I'll write to the bottom and make sure that you are being done. So that discrimination, the prejudice and, and all those things, are there within the care, healthcare system. They, uh, you know, about a decade or more ago, there was this New England Journal um, article that came out about, you know, that thing like exploring, is there really a racial bias within the healthcare system? Yes, there was. 
You know, people were complaining about the same symptoms, but women and men are treated differently, black and white are treated differently. This is what we experience. And that contributes to what we see in health disparities. And of course, there's what we all know, a lot of people want to go to the safe side, the individual level. Yeah, there are individual level factors. There is, you know, how we see ourselves, our health beliefs. There are things that are in the social environment that we have that really impacts that. Now, addressing, this is why it's so important that addressing health disparities, we really need to think about addressing all this level. We cannot just say, oh, we're going to talk about the individual. We are going to educate them about care and everything is going to be fine and dandy. Or we are going to create, you know, community gardens and everything will be all right. Of what use is creating community gardens and educating people when they are going to face discrimination by their provider or discrimination within the healthcare system is still going to lead into health disparities. So the onus is not all of us that all these three levels really has to be addressed for us to be able to address health disparities. Wow, there is all there. And you know, I, I think all of us appreciate your candor and your honesty. I mean, I wrote it down. There's discrimination in the healthcare system. Let's just call it out. Yep. So the question is, how do we fix it? Now, I, I, will, say, I will say to you, that over the years, um, I've talked a lot about the fact that in medicine, um, uh, men, men, they've treated men and women the same, just with different gonads, right? And, uh, and that there's not been clinical trials even differentiating males from females, let alone getting much more culturally, ethnically, racially diverse, which speaks to even more different kind of issues um, mm -hmm. and right how, how people are different. And so mm -hmm. I always like to say women have been over medicated since the beginning of time, right? Because of all of our dosages have been made on male cadavers, male researchers. And now when you extrapolate what you're saying, it's troubling. What have you yeah. seen from COVID? I mean, COVID has taught us a lot, mm -hmm. but yeah. um, so much of the research indicates that our minority populations, especially people of color, were far more impacted um, yeah. mm -hmm. by COVID than mm -hmm. other populations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so what is interesting is that all of a sudden when COVID came, people are talking about, oh, there is disparities, oh, I think it wasn't there. It just revealed what has been there, what we never, like, address head on, right? The disparities has always been there. If we had effectively addressed disparities that exist, then we would not really face what we face with COVID. And I'll give you an example. Take Florida, for, take Florida for an example. When we started rolling out the vaccines, right? Think about it. which zip codes received the vaccine the first. Okay, you're asking us the vaccine. Wait, what I mean, vaccine? I mean, just think, like the COVID-19 COVID vaccine, which, which zip codes? The, the, the vaccines were not even going into the areas that were disproportionately affected until all the new, you know, uh, until it was being reported in the news. So first of all, we started with, let's, let's use publics. So the question is gonna be, how many publics are actually in underserved and marginalized communities, right? So if we are rolling out the vaccine using places like publics, and don't get me wrong, I love publics, I'm just, going, I'm just giving that as an example, then that means there's no access. It took us time, right? And it took the federal government coming in and saying, okay, wait a minute, if we are going to address disparities and we need to get vaccine to all the minority and marginalized communities, we need to work with minority serving institutions, including HBCUs like Florida a and University. We need to go into the communities and work with churches because a lot of the churches are in these communities and let's get the vaccine through them. We need to work with the community pharmacists who are in this area so that they can get the vaccine. So even the solutions that we perpetuate, right it did not really take care of, of of those communities right so it's kind of like a way of you know COVID-19 did a lot of harm but we didn't have any choice it revealed also uh, yes. what was the underlying disparities right but you but another thing that I always think about in COVID-19 was that a lot of money was pumped into making sure that there's representations with the COVID-19 vaccine 
in making sure that we have clinical trials, in making sure that we enroll a lot of people. And I'm so proud of our communities because a lot of people in the black and brown communities stood up. People like myself, people who are medical doctors stood up and started saying, okay, wait a minute, it is killing us, right? So we need to do something. This is, the, this is the right time for us to do something. We need to be represented in the trials because we need to know that these vaccines are going to work in our populations. And we were able to get quite a significant number of people in our populations to be able to participate in the trials. We, what does that say? We can do it if we focus on it. Because we have learned, how do we get to the community? How do we get into the community? How do we recruit? How do we talk about it? How do we find out what is going to affect us from participating in, in COVID-19 trials? How do we use that information to be able to educate our folks? How do we get people out? We were able to, once we saw that we were dying from this, we were able to quickly get ourselves together and from the community level, get a lot of people from the community level doing this, including our medical association and, 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 and other healthcare associations. So we can do this, right? But we just need to be consistent in doing this and not say, oh, COVID-19 is almost over, so let's go back and relax. We it need to keep on it. We it cannot relax. Like, it doesn't feel like it's almost over. Um, no, it's not. And, and that's another thing. So, what, what are, so, so the issue that is, we cannot say, that we are effectively finding solutions to address COVID-19, but we have to relax when it comes to other chronic conditions. We really need to learn and continue what we have learned from COVID-19 to solve other disparities that we have. Because guess what? We are still dying from diabetes. We are still dying from cancer. We still have cardiovascular diseases. We still have all these other diseases that we have, that we do have disparities in. So let me also invite all of our guests to pose any questions they'd like in the chat. And we would love for Dr. Odedna to be able to answer them for you. Betty, come on, I need a good question from you. Betty and I would talk about some of these things as time go on, because what also was revealed was just how mistrustful the communities of color were of the medical industry, which mm -hmm. was not a border barrier physically, but was a big emotional, psychological, social barrier. Yeah. And you know, mistrust, distrust. Think about it. I mean, and a lot of people start thinking about, okay, we we have, you know, we have things like the Tuskegee. We have things in the past that is affecting us. Yes, but do we still have things that are currently affecting us right now? Hello. Yes, we still have things. So while we are struggling with all the mistrust and the distrust that is coming from the past history of things like Tuskegee or things like eugenics that has really affected our communities, right? In a very hard way in which we are treated for research and where we are treated in a very wrong way. We are still facing discrimination and insensitivity and bias and prejudice within the healthcare system. So it continues. So it's not even sometimes about the past, is that we're still facing it, right? You know, when I go into the community, I see people kind of tell me a lot about, you know, we, you know, walking into the healthcare system and then they kind of feel odd because of the way people look at them or the way of things that people are saying or, or, or the questions that they are getting asked. And it's so insensitive and it's not really something that is, uh, you know, culturally sensitive to them. And that continues to create it. So we have really, a challenge on our hand in how do we build the trust? And for quite a number of us that are doing the best to build the trust, what people don't realize is that it takes time to build trust. It takes a minute to validate the trust. So it has to be something that we devote our time on and that we are very consistent in doing. Another thing is that as we build the trust, one of the things that we have to understand, I always say this, it is great that everybody needs to be invested in health disparities and health equity, regardless of your race, regardless of your, of your background, regardless, we need champions. So, you know, so for example, Ashley Price is somebody who is like, you know, really in there and, and, and really wants to support and really wants to help. So we do need like friends from other communities who really will champion so that it's not only about the people who are affected by it, who are championing the thing, right? So that is very critical. 
But I want to say also, and people who know me on Twitter would know I'm always saying this, representation matters. Because guess what? As we fight disparities, as we think about achieving health equity, there's automatic trust that comes when you see people who look like you. While other people who are not from your same background who do not look like you, while you need to work on building this trust, it's almost like when you find a kinfolk, you're almost going, okay, wait a minute, maybe I can trust this person. Now, let me listen to what the person is saying. And so our ability to invest in representation and our ability to also make sure that we are pulling people in the community to also be partners in this fight as we address health disparities becomes very important. Okay, this is like, wow, I'm, I'm taking notes, which I always do. My mind is overwhelmed. My heart is absolutely touched. Lots of great questions coming up. I just want to remind everybody that we are at Refresh, here to refresh your spirit, for us to come together, learn together, and celebrate um, the goodness that comes with being part of this really great community. We're with Dr. Odedna, who is a world impactful, renowned cancer researcher who's also dedicated her life to understanding and impacting positively disparities in healthcare. And she's just telling us wonderful stories. Um, Trisha wants to know, Dr. O, can I say that? Yes. <laughs> I'm a Miss O, Dr. O. Um, what, what happened with your mom? Um, unfortunately, um, you know, she, she lived um, an okay life. We had continuous challenges with her health. She did, she, she's, she's dead now, but she did live, she was almost 80, uh, but it was something that, you know, it was it was always a challenge. And, and you know, she lived in Lagos, Nigeria before her death, um, almost every month I would get, I would get a call and I would have to, you know, she all, when she goes into the hospitals for the her episodes, she will always say, you have to talk to my, to my daughter in the US, she's gonna tell you what I need to use <laughs> before I take it, um, you know, but, you know, and again, it was because, you know, um, you know, I was able to go into, in, into the field of health and I was able to, but, uh, you know, almost 80, I think for what she went through when she was young, I think that was, that was, that was, that was good enough. So we had that for a long time. Thank you. Of course. And then, um... Beth Cravey, she's a fantastic writer, reporter, has a good question. Now, she's asked you if you're familiar with the Blue Zones program beginning in Jacksonville and your thoughts on its effectiveness. Yes. And so I to, uh, and explain it all to us because we're not sure what that is. Well, you know, so it's something that I learned uh, also. Uh, we are part of this group. One of the things that is uh, part of the um, um, Jacksonville, Florida, one of the reasons I'm very proud of it is that we have this group that is called, I, I believe, I hope I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, I'm saying that I think it's a population health consortium. So we do have a population health consortium and the Blue Zone is a community-based program that was actually presented. So that was my first time of hearing about what is going to be done within, within the, you know, within diversities to be able to address the social determinants of health uh, within different communities. That was the very first time and I haven't really had much about it. So I had it during the public, uh, uh, Public, uh, public health consortium. Um, and I think it was really a very healthy debate that went back and forth on the, on the blue zone. Um, and, um, you know, it, it seems like Mayo Clinic is going to be participating in the blue zone. I always think that if any program that is done in partnership with the community really is going to thrive and really is going to be very successful. It seems to be something uh, during this presentation, I will have to most probably learn more about the specifics, but when it was presented at the publication health, uh, uh, Public Health Consortium, it seems to be something that was done in partnership with the community, and it seems to be something that is well, very well cut out to make sure that it's going to be highly sustainable as well. So I am really looking forward to it, um, and it's great that Mayo Clinic is going to be part of this program, so it's kind of really outstanding uh, for us, but, you know, I think we really need to sort of see how it unfolds. Um, and see how we can maintain it. I think the sustainability of the program is going to be the key thing that we want to make sure that it happens to continue to be able to be effective. So what, I'm not, I just want to be clear. What, what is, exactly is it? Is it healthcare people coming together, making avail access and availability in certain places in a city that otherwise would not have access? So it's, it's not only healthcare 
uh, people from my understanding and for those who are directly you know involved in the program if you're on please add it to the chat i actually think that from the description is actually is going to involve quite a number of people within the healthcare and outside the healthcare and it's supposed to transform the behavior within uh, uh, within different communities, really focusing on changing social determinants of health. That is my understanding of it. So when you look at changing behavior, it's not only people within the healthcare system that it changes. For example, if you need like uh, physical activities and you need to be able to have a safe place for you to exercise and for you to walk, then that is something that most probably you're going to engage people who are going to, who are going to create a pathway uh, for activity. That is one of the things that I thought that um, was very strong about it. So it's bringing a really diverse team together to work on social determinants of health factors. Oh yeah, just reading it right there. I, I, it's right, right. This is a time when um, everybody's more focused on their interconnectedness of our health to that of our friends and neighbors in the face of the coronavirus co uh, crisis. And um, as a proven and comprehensive solution to influencing social determinants of That's health mm -hmm. and improving health equity. Yeah. So it's great. So this is really building on all of your work and your belief in not only recognizing what's going on, but now clearly building on that, right? Yeah. Well, yes. And, and one of the things that when it was, again, the, my first time of hearing it was when it was presented to our consortium, and I thought that it was great. One of the key things that we have to recognize is that is, you know, if we want to really solve the problem of health, it's not only people in the healthcare system that really would, uh, would really have the solution to the healthcare system. And the Blue Zone sounds like a program that recognizes that and is focused on social determinants of, of, of health and really trying to explore what can be done within the community to address issues that really are paramount within each of those systems. So to me, I think, that is the way to really have a highly sustainable program. And that is the way to make sure that there's maintenance within the program. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mbaum. Betty, Betty weighed in with a really good question. And she said, Dr. O, many of the current standards of care are not based on data from diverse communities. And this is addressed, of course, this tri uh, crit uh, the um, clinical trial issue you brought up. So the question is, are you personally involved with any initiatives or do you have any suggestions on what approaches should be taken to update these standards of care in oncology. For example, the age that patients should start being screened, we consistently see people of color being staged later at a at, at state, yeah, being staged later at presentation. How can, how can we address this? Wow, I mean, that is really a powerful, powerful question. And it is something that is seen all over the world in communities of color, which is really very concerning. But, okay, so let's kind of reel, reel it back. One of the things that I'm very proud that Mayo Clinic Cancer Center is doing is the fact that we need to kind of think that everything that we do has to be data driven. You know, sometimes we lose the touch. In fact, we had a meeting yesterday uh, about our, our Mayo Clinic Florida Cancer Center leadership team had a meeting yesterday. And we were kind of thinking about the fact that it is very important for us to lay out the data. So first of all, let's take a look at all the cancers that we have. Let's look at the cancer incidence. Let's look at the cancer mortality. Let's look at the cancer prevalence. Let's look at the behavioral risk factors that is taking place within the communities. And let's look at where are the points of access that people have. Once we do that, now let's take a look at what can we do to make sure that it's a critical point of access within those communities. Very great point. One of the things that I really want to talk about is the fact that sometimes, Yes, within people who are in the healthcare system and people who are doing science and people who are doing research, we should have the data. But guess what we also decided to do at the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center? We also want to develop a platform, an external facing platform that gives people within the community that data too, and that empowers you to be able to do the best that you can within that care. So this is really, outstanding. Yes, we need to use the data. At Mayo Clinic, we are actually using the data to do quite a number of things. And I want to give specific examples. A lot of you might not know what is called living labs. 
you might have heard what is community engagement research. Community engagement research is when we work collaboratively with, with, the, with, with the communities to be able to do what is best for the communities and working very closely with the community. But we are moving ahead to actually create something which is known as Living Labs. The Living Labs is a community-based platform that actually uses innovation to be able to solve the problem that is within the community. And that means that we decentralize everything. You know, I am so proud of what we're doing at Mayo Clinic now in our ability to say, okay, wait a minute, we cannot be within where we are and feel that our partnership with the community is just sufficient. We have to decentralize care. We have to decentralize clinical trials. We have to look at places within the community and, 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 and organizations within the community that we are going to be collaborating with to be able to make sure they are sustainable and their actions that are right there within the community. I'm gonna give three examples so that you understand very well what I'm, what I'm talking about. Our first example is, I'm not sure how many people are very fam are familiar with the American Legion post 197 within the community. If you are familiar with the American Legion, which is a black veterans organization, they are really situated within the community in Elzum, in Elzum one. They're right there. They're surrounded by, common, by the community. One of the things that we did at Mayo Clinic is that we went into a partnership with, the, with them and they have now become a hub for outreach and research for Mayo Clinic. They are our close partners, but guess what? They are our partners that are leading everything. So they are leading, they are designing how they are going to modify the post 197 to become a hub that everybody within that community will have access to everything that is needed, right? That is number one. Once we did that, we now got, we work very closely with post 197 to develop a program that is called the I Care for Black Men program. This I Care for Black Men program is a prostate cancer uh, uh, disparity study that is funded. We just received news that is funded by the Department of Defense. Phase one funding actually involves it's about $2.7 million direct cost and phase two funding is going to be $10 million direct cost. I, you know, post 197, is written in that grant so that they also get funding directly every year to be able to support. That is what I mean by decentralized, decentralizing everything. The solutions are in the community and is being led by people within the community. That's example number one. If I have time, I'll give you multiple other examples of what we're doing in Jacksonville. No, that that's that that is fantastic. And what you know, we have so much more, so many questions. We're going to talk a little bit better, but you left us, we always do a graphic that has some words of wisdom from our guest. Um, and you want we, we asked you, how do we leave a legacy? Kasha asked, what do we do to help? Um, let's take a look. Let's take a look at what you have, were offering. So the first one is standing on the shoulders. Who are you pulling? Talk, talk to us a little bit about that. Yes. So, you know, so first of all, um, you know, for me, we need to stand on the shoulders of those who are before us. I, I think a lot of things that we have done is because of people who pull us up to be where we are. And that is very critical. And so it is very important for me that we need to pull other people up as well. And the idea of mentoring and the idea of people who are going to replace us is so critical. Every time in my mind, every day that I wake up, I have to ask myself, who else can I pull up? And once I have a position, so for example, I have different positions in different organizations and different consortium, how do I then step back and give that position in that consortium, in that organization to somebody else who is coming behind me? And I think that is very important because we have to replace ourselves and we have to make sure that we continue to do the work. Um, a good example is that Mayo Clinic is, you know, has this program that is for underrepresented minorities and we, are, we have several college students who are spending the summer with us and I've been tweeting about it. It's so amazing to see people who are from our communities, who are from Jacksonville. Majority of them are from Edward Waters University and who are now part of Mayo, who are doing exactly the same work that we are doing. And they are looking at clinical trials. You know, one of them is Kathleen Willis, happens to be my mentee. And when she meets with me, Kathleen says, 
oh, Dr. David, I'm so excited. I think I'm a researcher. I think I got it. I'm going to do my research question. I think, oh my goodness, I have my, I have my twin, right? Who is going to do the work? Then I can relax and then I can hear the notes. So that is very important. I cannot speak well enough about clinical trials. I really think one of the greatest reasons that we have disparities is about clinical trials. So I just want to kind of talk to people a little bit about what clinical trials is. Clinical trials is the gold standard for us to find therapies and interventions for any conditions that we have, whether it's chronic conditions, infection conditions like COVID-19. We have to do clinical trials to make sure that the vaccine is going to work. And we have to do clinical trials to make the drugs are going to work to make sure the therapies are going to work. Now, let's think about that, that our population needs to be represented for us to know whether it is going to work in us, but we are not being represented. So we actually have therapies and interventions and devices that are being developed without our representation. And majority of the time or sometimes it's gonna fail. It's not gonna work in us, right? And I do understand, we talked about mistrust, we talk about distrust, we talk about that. But one of the things that I tell people is that we deserve the best. Minoritized, marginalized communities, we deserve the best. And regardless, right, regardless of what is going on, we have to make sure that we fight to get the best. So we're gonna fight. We really have to make sure that we are represented in clinical trials and that is really very clear to me. And that is part of what is known as taking care of our community as well. That is very important. If I take care of clinical trial, guess what? Other people, who has similar DNA that I have, who are from my population, they're gonna benefit from that. Lastly, self-care. Absolutely, but there, it, it's interesting, um, and we're almost out of time here, and Ashley, you brought this up, the idea of volunteering to participate in clinical trials, all of us, is in our collective best interest, so we, but we don't have a culture of that, right? It's only been for a very small segment of our population, so we have to really be able to talk about it and be able to get the messages out. I mean, I see it in immunotherapies and cancer are coming from clinical trials, which is advancing cancer care, as you well know, um, exponentially. So um, really, really important. And then the last thing you mentioned was self-care. Oh, self-care is so important. And like I said, I'm really bad in that, but I'm getting better. I'm really getting, the last five years, I'm getting better. There's really, you know, I can't remember, you know, very clearly, but listen, an African adage that talks about the roots, that if the root is rotting, the branches would die. And what does that mean? We can talk about how we are helping our community. We can talk about how we are mentoring. We can talk about other people that we want to pull up, right? But if we, the roots, if we are bad, there is no way that we can do that because all the branches are going to die. And so we really have to take time to really, really, really take care of us. And, you know, I see that you talk about it, you know, you know, going on health. One of the things that I do, or not, you know, that, that I do, within the last five years, I started doing this. I never stopped until COVID came in. I literally, with a bunch of about 10 to 15 of my girlfriends, we do go on get tri girls trips annually to a different country. And it's usually a time for us to connect, a time for us to just, and a time for us to really support each other in all the things that we do. So this is really all very- right. I think we're, we're gonna like start our Generation W girls trip. <laughs> Dr. O, you're gonna lead it. I'm up for it, I'm up for it. Trish, everybody, Ashley, we're all going. <laughs> everybody, like, listen, we're all in. Let me just say this, it's been a really, first of all, your energy is palpable. Um, I think at least what I'm taking away, and I, as I see here, is that we all are part of communities and we are only as good as the least healthy of that person. I, I, you wrote, everyone, you said, everyone has to be invested in health disparities. Yeah. And it's more than just having a cold, it's about our overall wellness and our community's wellness, right? Is at the behest of um, each one of us having the opportunity to be as healthy as we can be. And we all need to care about that because it lifts us all up. I'm going to go back to Helen Keller where I started. The welfare of each is bound up in the welfare of all. Dr. O, we thank you for your thank work you. on an ongoing basis. We thank you for your enthusiasm, your brilliance. Um, there's so much more to talk to here. 
I, you know, to dig back into this idea of provider level practices. How do we make sure that everybody is exposed to understanding cultural, social, ethnic, racial differences in our health presentations so that we can all be diagnosed much more effectively and efficiently. And we can talk about that perhaps at another time. Right now we have to get going. We'll be back in two weeks for our last show before the summer starts on June 15th. Uh, and for those of you who know me, it is this is another show that speaks to our legacy about community, but it is the 50th anniversary of Title IX. And for those of you, mm -hmm. I guess most of you probably grew up with Title IX. Some of us kind of bordered it a little bit. Um, if you're a fan of women's sports or believe that women's participation in active engagement in sports is a life-changing activity, which I do, had the privilege of speaking uh, for at a UN event as sports being a global activity to left, lift women out of poverty um, and build better communities. So we're gonna get to talk about that on the 15th. We have an amazing guest. Her name is Sarah Toussaint. She's the co-owner of the North Carolina Courage. I love when women are owning sports teams, um, which is the uh, NWSL, the North American Women's uh, Soccer League. She's a sports marketer, a board member for Play Like a Girl. She's had tremendous uh, experience and is a true advocate for women in sports and has devoted most of her career to paving pathways to success for the underdogs. Is that who we are? I'd like to think we're the power dogs. So tune in June 15th to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Title IX and, and discuss the way women and sports have progressed and how we can continue to elevate them, which is, again, I think related to this whole idea of legacy and creating communities of health, wellness, and teamwork. Thank you all, be well, and refresh. <laughs>